Well, hello everyone and welcome to the first rendition of Common Sense with two guests at once. Today's guests are Bowtie Cobra and Bowtie Bangle, the jungle's physio experts. Hello gentlemen, how are you doing tonight? Good, how are you? Doing great. <laughs> awesome. So we'll see how this uh, anonymous, no faces, audio only Zoom call will go. But to start, why don't both of you introduce yourselves to those who are listening? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first, Bangle, if you're cool with that. Yeah, we're actually so, sitting next to me. Yeah, we're on the same couch. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually neighbors, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm Bowtie Cobra. I've been in sports medicine for just under 10 years. I work with athletes exclusively. That's probably the biggest difference between myself and Bangle. Um, and I've worked at every level. So I've covered athletes from the high school level to pro football, pro baseball, D1 athletics, everything in between. So I've seen it all. got a pretty good mix of, of experience. So that is, uh, that's my brief background. Mm -hmm. In Bengali? Yeah? No. Uh, yeah. So I've been, uh, I don't know, practicing about 10 years as well. Um, I started in uh, sports, quote unquote, sports is different um, in what Tober does and what I do sports is more like uh post-op so I started in sports um and then I went to another clinic that was quote unquote sports but it was a lot of chronic pain um so it was a lot of spine stuff and then I went back to sports quote unquote sports um so it was a lot of well there's some athletes weekend warriors and just like regular people and then now the clinic I'm at now is uh it's mostly military actually so um I guess you could call that sports. So sports is a very arbitrary term from <laughs> the rehab side, at least on my in my my perspective. So, but yeah, uh, I spent a lot of time in spent a lot of time in gyms. So I worked in a lot of like regular gyms and CrossFit gyms and stuff like that. So, oh, I'm interested to see if uh, CrossFit is as injury prone as I hear about on Twitter. I've never done one of those classes. But I think my first question, just based on your, both of your intros would be, how is treating athletes versus chronic pain or other type of patients? Like how does the treatment really vary depending on the patient that you're seeing and the type of clinic that you are operating in? Cobra, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, so I don't know if the treatment necessarily changes that much. I'd say the biggest difference is, for one, the recovery times are much less, so athletes heal quicker generally. So that helps a lot. So actually, when I was uh, in undergrad, I was working in a PT office as well as a, as a tech. So I, I would actually go from a tech job at a PT office with old ladies having to literally carry their oxygen mask to <laughs> pro baseball players with arms worth – 20 million dollars so it was an extreme dichotomy of of difference in performance the biggest thing though is just the athletes are going to have to be exposed to generally speaking a much higher load and demand on the tissue because they just do more than the average person so the end the end rehab is a lot more aggressive a lot more explosive more plyometric based than the average person needs because the average person just doesn't need to you know throw a ball hundred miles an hour, you know, run a four, four forty. They just don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different in terms of what they need, but the treatment doesn't change a ton though. You're doing basically the same stuff. The body only has so many different ways it can, it can move and exert force. So for me, the biggest thing is just, they just heal substantially faster. And one follow-up question on that, you mentioned um, helping like pro athletes, for instance, how, condensed is the recovery time for athletes. I think I saw one or both of you tweet about this. Are most athletes getting back on the field far before they are fully recovered? How typical is that? Does that have long-term consequences for their health? Obviously like football, it's gonna have long-term consequences no matter what, but would you say that's the typical thing and how much more condensed would you say it is? <laughs> it, it's substantially condensed. So the, the big thing is what's best for the injury and what's best for the athlete and the team generally aren't the same thing. Um, like if you had to choose, you know, 
your injury versus playing in a game that mattered. You're going to choose playing. So you're going to do everything in your power to make sure they can get through that game. So the goal would be to to more so get them in as little pain as possible and hop them on as many pain meds as possible, typically, to get them to play through that game. And you're just pushing down that healing down the road. So you're definitely sacrificing long-term health for a short-term game. But that's also just the the nature of sports, unfortunately. It's health isn't really prioritized in the, the grand scheme of things. Because, you know, if you had to choose, you know, do you play or do you miss the playoffs? You're gonna play. Like it's yeah. it's just how it is. So for me it's it's much more how can we manage this injury and get them functional? Because function and healing aren't the same thing. You could have somebody with a pretty moderately torn tissue you know let's say they have a grade two hamstring strain which normally takes weeks you can get them functional in much less than six eight weeks they may not be able to perform at their best but if it's your star player you know, you're going to take him at 80 percent versus the backup at 100 mm-hmm. percent. so you just sacrifice that long-term health for the for the now that makes a lot of sense um and i think that is you know, everyone can understand that and sees it all the time when they're watching professional sports where people bounce back from seemingly very <laughs> intense injuries within a couple of weeks. Bangle, a question for you. What drew you into physical therapy to begin with? Um, well, I was, I had this girlfriend and I was going to go back to school and get an MBA. And she was like, you shouldn't go get an MBA because you'll just have the job that you like. I was working at a, for like a fortune 500 company and it was kind of like, yeah, you know, whatever. And then I was like, I think I'm gonna go get an MBA. And she's like, yeah, you'll just get the same job that you don't like. You should go do something else like personal training or physical therapy. So I was like, Oh, I'll have to look into that. And then I looked into it and I was like, that's a great idea. We're going to break up. I'm going to move away. So that's how I got into (laughs) physical therapy. Uh, And did you make the right decision? I mean, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) okay so another question that i had and i think this is something that we're seeing with the jungle a lot recently is why join forces together so you both enter the jungle at different times maybe relatively similar times we're tweeting about very similar things i imagine and then somehow you came to the conclusion that you were better as a duo than as a single entrepreneur so what was the reasoning for joining forces so if you really think of so cobra's not a physical therapist cobra's an athletic trainer so mm-hmm. his skill set is like we got a lot of overlap but his skill set is completely different than mine um like he's he's there at the point of injury um so he's good at like the acute care management and i i have no, i have none of that so as I was like doing, as I was like making things and like making some products, I would see like the stuff that he was talking about. And I was like, huh, if I'm not careful, he's going to take off and he's going to be the injury guy. So I better team up with him. That way we can probably go farther together. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I guess I kind of used him um, to like (laughs) not let him go and be the superstar that he could be. I had a much different answer than that, but (laughs) (laughs) that was the answer. Was that not the? Yeah, I mean, there's truth to that. So, so with with me, I I literally will have athletes. So when when an athlete will like break their ankle, sprain their knee, I am there, usually within like twenty thirty seconds. Like I am the very first point of care. So I'm really really good at the acute stuff because that's what I see the vast majority of. Yes, I rehab, but it's usually not the more long term stuff that he does. So. It's just a very natural pairing because I'm better than him at the front end stuff and he's better on the back end long term stuff. And uh and he's also selfish. So yeah. <laughs> so so together we're like a like a super person. Right. You're like in kicking and screaming where they put the little kid on the big kid and win the soccer game. Your let's talk about your website. So I'm hurt now what? What was the you know, the instigator for this is the website that we're going to offer. Here's how we're going to help people. Um, and how has that been going for you guys? Good. I'll take that one. So first off, the name is all Bengals idea, hundred percent. That was totally him. 
I actually wanted to change it initially because I thought it was too long for a domain, but uh, but he won and it was the right decision there. But initially my plan with the jungle was to, when I first got it was to build this massive archive of of exercises for, for injuries, rehab, everything. But when I started to get into it, I realized how much work it was. And I wasn't in a place IRL to be able to handle that much workload without just totally just failing as being a father and husband. So I put that on the sideline. And then back about a year ago, Bengal was talking to a guy on Twitter about an elbow injury and I quote tweet him and offered a suggestion to help. And then he hopped in my DM and then started talking from there and it just went from there. So basically Bengal hopped in my DMs and we started a business. Very cool. And so people can go to your website and they can get help with any injury that they have. Are there certain types? Is this something that athletes can go uh, look at to see what they need help with if they got hurt in a game? Is it for the weekend warrior types? Is it for everybody? It's for um, everybody. Yeah, it's for everybody. And it's kind of, I don't know, I want to say to be determined, but a lot of it started because like, if you think of like what we do, like the, our, our rehab philosophies are pretty similar and it's because we've been like actually rehabbing people. So when you go on, when you Google an injury, you're always going to get these like pretty shitty Google first page stuff is always like WebMD, mm -hmm. uh, Mayo Clinic and stuff like that. And it's just like, just, you know, ice, NSAIDs, rest, you know, it's like terrible advice. So really it was like, all right, well, let's just start putting together advice that's like actually practical. Um, and then it's like, what is it we have to do to get onto the first page of Google? So that's kind of the, one of the goals of the website. Um, and then it all kind of ties into everything else. So, um, so I've, I've worked in clinics, but I've also tried to do like some cash based stuff on the side and and things like that. And the thing I've learned is that it's uh, seeing having like actual visits with people is a, a very inefficient. Um, it's a kind of a waste of time um, because one, the price that you're going to charge, um, and then just you, you spend the first like six visits like figuring out the person. So if you're going to have someone pay you and you're figuring out the first, you know, six weeks, of just even like what's even wrong with the person, um, there needs to be some work that can be done before that, before you even see them. So that's kind of like the process we do now where it's like someone's like, hey, I got this issue. We send them our consult form. They fill it out. Then we send them like, oh, we'll try this website stuff. So ideally, the person has already been trying like, you know, four to six weeks of stuff before we even see them. Mm -hmm. So partially it's uh, one one aspect of the website is just infrastructure. Um, so people have resources. So that way, whenever they do want to do a consult, it's like, hey, I tried this exercise. I tried that exercise, et cetera, et cetera. And then just by them telling us that, like, we kind of already know what's wrong with them. You know, it's like my knee hurts, but I, and I tried this one exercise and it's like, oh, well, like I've, I've had people email me guys like, uh, I got some shoulder pain. Um, I'm doing therapy. He's doing this, he's doing that. And this is happening and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, I think it's your neck. You should go get your neck checked out. And then he like emails me back. He's like, oh, it was my neck, you know? So it's like, I, I don't have to, if, if I know what you're doing, then I don't really have to evaluate you, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the purpose of like the program, rehab programs, the website, the Twitter content, and all that stuff. That makes a ton um, of sense. So that way, when you do reach out, yeah. So it's just an efficiency thing. Um, that makes it. That makes so much sense to me, and I think it's in the best interest of the patient as well. Yeah. The yeah. Discussion of like figuring out what the actual problem is. Um, can take a while. It can take a lot of time. And also it's the body is complicated. Um, I relate to that very much because I was telling Cobra previously. So I got hurt in high school playing soccer and I thought, and my back was hurting really bad. So I just got hit in the air and my back was hurting very bad. So I went to the physical therapist 
And the first one that I went to said, your back is hurting. She put me on the ice and stem stuff and she did the back massage and just tried to like release the tension in the back and nothing happened. And like, I was 17 or 16 and had crippling back pain. Like it was really strange. So I changed physical therapists and he had me do all these weird, completely what seemingly unrelated exercises to my back. And he's like, your hips are tight. (laughs) He's like, dude, (laughs) that's your problem is that your hip is out of whack and it's internally rotated to the left. And he had to put it back in place. So I find it fascinating that there is such a variation in how good the physical therapists are. So would you say that the average physical therapist that someone walks into is going to be good at their job and find the right solution to your problem? Well, that's a loaded question, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> like you're gonna make me. Like, uh, I'll say no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to say no because you know I'm not the type that's gonna just like disparage everybody. But it, it's it's a little more complicated than that. Well, maybe it's not. There's, I mean, it sounds like your first therapist was just bad. Yeah. Um, but it, it's like if a 17 year old girl came in and she's like oh I hurt my back it's like what happened it's like well I was jumping and someone ran into me it's like all right let's test everything it's like nothing is wrong with your back it just hurts um, like it's like trauma you know nothing's you know as long as nothing's broken and you don't have any like you know symptoms that would make me think a, a structure is messed up mm-hmm. then it's like well it's gonna it's going to feel better over time and then you know, I would still do the assessment and then, you know, the, was it your hips or just like the, just doing normal exercise, like made you feel better. Like you, you're never going to, there's always this kind of little column A, little column B. So the extreme version of that is that I evaluated a guy the other day, um, what's the day? Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, I evaluated a guy yesterday. Uh, it's a 55 year old guy used to be in the air force. Um, he had back pain. Um, he had a hip replacement like two years ago and, you know, his back still hurt. And they're like, oh, it wasn't your hip, you know, uh, gotcha. <laughs> it, was, it was your back. Mm-hmm. So like his back is super stiff, but his hip doesn't even work, right? So that's an extreme example where his hip, his hip stiffness is probably related to his back pain, right? Because he doesn't even have like normal motion, normal strength because he had a surgery. Mm-hmm. So like, his treatment for that first day was like just you know actually the piriformis syndrome blog post that we have i like literally gave him those exercises just to like start moving his hips because they're stiff um you know it's like the pain was still there but he stood up he's like oh man, i feel so much better you know like i'm looser you know so in on the extreme extreme side yeah loosening up the hips because when you move the hips the backer is going to move uh will make the back feel better um so i i guess yes your first therapist sucked (laughs) your your second therapist um like he was a little more uh holistic in his approach to where he's like well just move because i get that a lot it's like someone's got chronic back pain and it's like well nothing is medically wrong with you so we're just going to do stuff Mm -hmm. um and the stuff i do you know, moves you in a bunch of positions and you move sideways, you move forward, you move backwards. Uh, you know, you're like strengthening everything. So the back, you get blood flow to the back and it feels better purely by the nature of the exercises I pick. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. No, it totally does. Um, one of the other things that that good physical therapist did is he gave me this thing that you lay on and it stretches out your psoas so your super deep hip flexor and now I sit at a desk like all day long for work and it helps so much that is the one thing I've noticed like I use it all the time even now and it it's crazy that the so I don't understand what's going on could you explain that actually the psoas why does like releasing the psoas, a super deep hip flexor, release everything else in your lower part of your body. One, one, you can't really release the psoas because you can't really get to it. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but really, you're just massaging it. Um, anytime it's just pressure based 
any any pressure based massage technique is going to make you feel better. So um, it's a little bit placebo. Uh, <laughs> uh, like now you're gonna start going to do it again. You're like, hey, you told me this doesn't even do anything. You know, you're <laughs> throw <it> away. <laughs> but uh, it's you know if you have like a you know if you if you have a knot in your quad and you like put your finger into that knot and then like move your like bend and straighten your knee you know you're doing like pressure based massage techniques so that's kind of what those is is it a so right is it that like u shaped thing that you lay on yeah um so that's I've, i see people using those and not buying at dinner at the gym all the time um uh, <laughs> But that's basically what it's doing. It's this uh, pressure-based massage technique. It's no different than getting massage, but it's because of your weight being on it and you're able to relax. Um, like it gives some, uh, it reduces that tone that's in the muscular, mu in the muscles. I, I can do a quote unquote, like so as release where like someone just lays down and I just kind of dig my fingers uh, like two inches to the side of their belly button. And you just have them breathe. And it's just like the breathing relaxes them. So because because they're relaxing, like muscles relax. Mm. Um, versus like actual, like treating a tissue. Especially one that's, you know, several layers deep that you may or may not be touching. That makes sense. Um, one of the things that I found on your website that I found most helpful and most interesting was the stuff for the desk monkeys out there. I think that's yeah. a lot of people listening. So if someone is trapped in a chair for the majority of the day, what should they be doing to mitigate some of that tenseness and stress that they're adding to their body by not moving it around? Whoever would like to take that one. People get too confused about, you know, do I need to be doing, you know, thoracic rotation extension like just just do something like anything's better than nothing because most people do nothing which is why most of these uh like goofy practices work because doing literally anything any stimulus is better than no stimulus so just move it doesn't have to be too complex just do something that makes sense and also would you say that the majority of people you treat are out of shape how would you assess the fitness of the human populace as you see it from your clinics or from the silence cover may not be as applicable to you because you're working with athletes but yeah even they're getting fat now though so i mean it's <laughs> i'm seeing it some and you can just tell you know the athlete walk in you know be a little bit meaner but if you have a volleyball girl walk in you now and she's 40 pounds or weight her knees hurt i mean that's why her knees hurt. Are you allowed to say that? You know? I'm not not allowed to. It's definitely not encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's true, though, right? I mean, if you're 40 pounds overweight and you're running and jumping a bunch, your knees are going to hurt. You know, so I mean, it's definitely more common than it used to be. But I can usually tell just when I have kids or just athletes rehabbing in general. You know, if, if I have someone do like two sets of step ups and they're winded, you know, they can't do a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. So it, it's definitely more prevalent. I probably don't see it as much as Bengal does, but it's, it's even athletes now are getting fat. It's, it's <laughs> everybody. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's easy for the Marines or the military that I have, cause they take a fitness test. So I can ask them what their score is. And based off their score, I'll, I'll kind of know what they're like, relative fitness level is, uh, give or take. And then I can just ask them, like, you know, I have a pretty basic understanding of what, like, general fitness is and, like, what it takes to accomplish that, you know, just, like, general strength training, aerobic work, a little bit of, you know, some jumping, some plyometrics, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, like, what – that's part of the intake I ask people is, like, what's your normal routine? And they'll tell me all these things, and then – I I find that a lot with military people is they do a lot of uh, they have a performance job but they do not do performance training. So uh, you played collegiate soccer, high school, right? 
Oh, high school soccer. Okay. Um, but just imagine at any level of soccer, if like whenever you guys did, did you guys lift weights in mm-hmm. in high school? Okay. So imagine if when you went to lift weights or whenever you're doing like strength and conditioning stuff, all you did was like bicep curls, um, and uh I don't give me another exercise that's not athletic. Bicep curls and uh, balancing on a BOSU ball. And then, you, <laughs> and then you went out and like played sports. And you're like, man, these other teams, for some reason, they're faster than us. They're stronger than us. I don't understand. Right. And it's like, all right, well, the reason why that's happening is because the, the performance training you are doing does not translate to the performance that you're doing. Um, so a lot of my questioning is like, whenever I, I don't, I don't want to say interrogate, whenever I interrogate a patient, <laughs> um, <laughs> those are the, those are the things that I'm, I'm getting from them. And then I basically put them on a performance program. Um, and then I progressed it based off them because you'll see kind of the holes in their own fitness. It's usually aerobic, um, like usually they just get winded because they don't, they never do like aerobic work. Mm-hmm. Oh. So I have a couple of questions relating to that. Um, first, what would you say is the true standard of being fit for an adult male? Like what are the things that you're not an elite athlete, but you're at least in shape? How fast should you be able to run a mile? What should your bench press be? And, or are those not the right metrics? what would you guys say is the definition of being fit? I mean, I'd say minimally you should be able to do like, if you're like, I have two little kids. If you should be able to minimally keep pace with your little children Mm -hmm. and whatever that entails. Like if you're winded chasing around your two-year-old, you have work to do. If you can't sit on the floor with your baby for more than 20 minutes because your back hurts, you have work to do. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good starting point is if you're, your kids are outdoing you i'd probably uh look in the mirror at that point Hmm. there's really no metric to to gauge that by but you know if you get winded carrying your toddler on your shoulders around disneyland maybe uh pick something up you can go back to our sports analogy like athletes don't lift weights to like be good at lifting weights they lift weights so they can like be good at sports right so it's it's activity related so as cobra was saying if you are the activity is playing with your children like if you can't do that then you know the um running a mile and doing bench press is a a tool to get better at the activity versus a tool to itself which is why most people get hurt because it's all they do is uh, the the exercise is the goal for them versus like the exercise is the tool. I think that's a really interesting way of putting it. And it's leading me into another discussion that I wanted to get your guys' take on, which was some of these myths or just hot button topics that we see on Twitter a lot. So we mentioned CrossFit at the beginning of this discussion. (laughs) So I want to know, is it really that bad for you? Why is it that bad for you? And then some of the other things you guys mentioned were rice. So when you get hurt. Rest, when- ice, compression, elevation. There's like six other variations of it that are also utterly useless. Okay. So I want to know why that's utterly useless because I was told to do that throughout my high school soccer career. I guess we can, uh, I'll lead with rice because it's angers me. But uh, <laughs> essentially it was, uh, it was coined by, by Dr. Merkin like back in like the 1970s and that was his theory on it. And the rationale for why it's 20 minutes is because he asked his college athletes how long their lunch break is. And they told him 20 minutes. So it was never even based on anything even remotely scientific. It was just what was convenient. Um, but even since then, he's recanted, said it doesn't work. So essentially when there's an injury, I'm not get too into the, the weeds of the response, but the inflammation phase is the first phase of healing. So if you want to heal, you have to have inflammation. And rice, ice, police, price, whatever one of those you prefer, they're all dumb. All they do is delay inflammation. So you're just delaying healing. They don't even reduce inflammation because you're decreasing blood flow. So if you were to take a hose and you were to clamp it off, how would you get water out of it? 
Like that's the claim people use that it gets rid of inflammation. Like you literally shut off blood vessels. So nothing gets in or out. So it doesn't even delay, reduce inflammation, just delays it, which delays healing because inflammation is necessary to heal. So it's completely useless if your goal is optimal healing. There's always nuance to everything. You know, if your only goal is pain reduction and that's all you care about, sure, you can argue it has some merit because it's, it's good for reducing pain and it's very cheap. But there's other ways to reduce pain that don't delay healing. I mean, actually, someone on Twitter asked me the other day if what they do, like in boxing, when they're icing in between rounds, that's actually delaying the inflammation so his eyes wouldn't swell shut mm. so he can see. So, you know, there, it does have very, very extreme use cases, but generally it's utterly useless and it's going to slow down the healing process. So you should be heating it and improving blood flow and moving it. So if a, an athlete gets hurt in the middle of the game and it's a huge game, they need to get back out there for the second half and they twisted their ankle or they got knocked in their knee, what is the acute treatment? If it's not compressing and icing it, what do you do in that moment trying to help them get back on the field? So it depends what their goal is. If it's something they can play through or they're going to try and play through, there's like, I can do a bunch, I can do all kinds of taping and bracing and, and various options to, provide a temporary support to the structure. Uh, we use some topical painkillers, try to minimize some pain. There's all kinds of stuff we can do. Sometimes even just literally, say it's a football game, a kid has a bad ankle sprain in the first quarter. If he just sits and chills, he usually feels better come second half. So there's all kinds of stuff you can do. In the event that he doesn't return to the game, I mean, they kind of just hang out and chill, just do nothing, because just let inflammation happen. Mm. The body knows how to heal, so a lot of times the best thing is just to get out of its way and not do too much. So usually if the kid, if the athlete is no longer able to play, I just leave them, do their thing, and go back to, to covering the game. I will say when I was in pro baseball with a certain team, when pitchers would finish whatever outing, starting pitching, really pitching, whatever, they would come out and they would immediately go into the bullpen and they would do like a five to ten minute band workout super lightweight, just move their shoulders, get the muscles firing, get blood to it, and be done. So they would literally do light strength training right after their, their outing. Mm -hmm. Never icing. That was probably kind of cutting edge because you see like pitchers like come out of the game and they go sit and put ice on their shoulder in the dugout. So that was them going and actually doing some actual – blood flow work was, was that kind of like one of the only teams doing that at the time i'm interviewing cobra now <laughs> uh yeah i'll leave it at that because that potentially might dox but yeah yeah never mind yes <laughs> um one other issue close to my heart is acl tears I've had so many friends that have had it happen and they start because it was happening so frequently, all the teams started implementing this warm up where you would do the banded stretches. So essentially like a very short, lightweight, uh, weightlifting session for your knees. So all of the, like, whatever the rotating of the hips and the big jumps and all of the banded works and this, I forget what they're called now, but all the different types of walks um, solely to try to mitigate the ACL epidemic that was happening with young girls. Um, I wonder if either of you have a take on some of those things. Do you think that those are effective? Have you seen an uptake in ACL tears? Did it work? I didn't tear mine. It worked for yeah. me. Um, There's a lot so, of nuance to that one. Yeah. The only, I mean, I mean the only uh, like, Warm up that I guess has some evidence to it is like the FIFA 11 workout. Um, I think it has a lot of like jumping and landing and stuff. So that's kind of what you want to do. Um, because when you start looking at the mechanism of how ACLs tear, I, I haven't treated a post op person in a long time. Um, the sports clinic I was at, 
like we did a lot of that, but I don't see it much anymore. So there's probably all kinds of new stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but females, um, a lot of the, there's so many, so many different factors that are the reason why they're, they're just more ACL tears. One is like just participation. So just like more females playing sports. Um, so there's more knees, more knees and more, mm. more knees to get, to get broken. It's a terrible way to say it. Um, and then uh, the participation aspect of it, there's just strength in general, just uh, females are just not as strong as males are. Uh, I think the development has something to do with it, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, so in a way, anything which is kind of like what we were talking about earlier when you're sitting all the time, like anything would help them um, because most of them do nothing. It just mm -hmm. depends on, are you, are you from like a, are you from like a really small town? Are you from like a, like was it a big school or? Big you know, school, like, big club scene. Yeah. Um, so. That's, that's another tangent, the club sports. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing where it's just like, you're just playing soccer again. It's, it's, uh, it's, um what's the word is the incidents maybe i don't know where you're just playing so much more so like you're going to see all these injuries purely because you know there's all these asteroids running around by the earth eventually one of them's gonna hit us right <laughs> it's kind of the same the same concept there um yeah those those warm-ups are good i mean they're I, I don't know what your normal strength and conditioning look like um but any, anything that works on strengthening the muscles around there and then you know landing mechanics that's usually what they want to do yeah um, yeah yeah i'll add i mean that warm-up's fine it's you know it's better than nothing but the main thing is going to be getting really strong in weight room doing plyometrics building up the capacity to, to tolerate forces and then other things you can't really control with females just in terms of just anatomy you know, we, they go through periods, you know, and there's data that shows that when a woman's on her period, she's, you know, she loses mineral density, is more likely to get injured. I mean, so what's the option? You know, you just don't play sports that whole week. You know, that's not really a solution. So some things you're kind of fighting an uphill battle. But I mean, getting big, strong, fast, usually is a pretty good starting point for everything. Yeah, and I think it was so interesting to me was because it was the first time that we had had a structured warm up with bands like that. Um, and I've been playing for a long time. You guys kind of both jumped in when I mentioned club sports. So I'd be interested to hear what your take is on club sports and how it differs from high school sports. Well, the problem is they do them both at the same time. So, right. so it's just way too much volume. So you can look at it, even if, cause I, I work, you know, with your demographic when you were an athlete primarily mm -hmm. now, and so, you know, kids will play club soccer all year round, and then they'll also play high school soccer, and then they'll go from one practice to another, and then high school soccer one, and then they'll go to track, but they'll also still be doing club soccer. So you're never getting that recovery at all. You're doing the same thing over and over and over, you know, and I, and I think I'd have to double check. I think the incidence rate for an ACL is one in 10,000 events. So just the more you do, just the more risk you have. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly playing soccer, and especially, you know, a lot of soccer now is you're increasing the amount of turf fields, which also increase your injury rate. So as you're it's just asking for a disaster when you're playing soccer all year round on club and then never resting on, because you don't have an off season. So it's just way too much volume. You never recover. Yeah, I find it really interesting. Um, that was exactly my experience. I play soccer four hours a day. And I mean, I was loving it at the time, but I definitely felt it. Um, my club coach would often call my high school coach because he knew her and like scream at her because she was making us do really intense fitness or calisthenics or something in the middle of the intense part of the club season, but it was preseason for high school. So we were all sore on the weekend from her workout. And he was like, Yep. Human at her, that kind of thing. Um, the year round club for any type of sport, how new is that? Because that was my entire life. It was always year round. 
So is that a new phenomenon? I don't think so. I mean, it's, I don't think I'm much older than you though. So yeah, it's, that's all I've known. And it's, it also depends where you're at in, in a warm climate, you're playing stuff all year round. So that's a lot of it as well. You know, but if there's never any true winter, you can play soccer 12 out of 12 months. Mm -hmm. So that's all I've known since I've been working, but I don't know when that transition necessarily, but it's not new to me. Yeah, it's probably uh, maybe go back to when you guys started, maybe add another five, five years to it. Um, relatively, I was at a uh, conference with the, what's his name? James Andrews. He was giving a talk on like just how kids do too much stuff. And, you know, here he was like, he was traveling the world, giving these presentations. And he was like at his daughter's house or talking to his grandkids and his daughter's like, Oh, well, they're going, I got to take them to swimming. Then I got to take them to soccer. Then I got to like doing all this stuff. And he's just kind of like, you know, like looked at his hands, like, what the fuck am I doing? None of this is working. <laughs> so like here he is traveling the world, like talking about kids playing too much sports. And it's like grandkids are like going all over the place playing like sports all the time. So it's like, it's just like a very powerful machine. I think the youth baseball trap, like, like, what is it either 10 or 11 or 12 year old like travel baseball industry is like a billion dollar industry that doesn't surprise me at all up sports are nuts it's absurd i wanted to like write a research paper on this because it's very dear to my heart um they would make us pick which sport we were gonna play at like 10 years old so like i played tennis i was a gymnast i played soccer and they're like you're never gonna play anything if you don't pick well, soccer that's also the issue is just the the over specialization of athletes at too young of an age. Yeah. That's how you get, that's how you get all the chronic stuff, especially in baseball. Baseball is the worst because you'll have kids that are 11. I'm a pitcher. Dude, you're a baseball player. Go, go play the whole <laughs> field. You're not, you're not a pitcher. You're, you haven't hit puberty yet. And then that kid will guarantee he'll pop his elbow by the time he's 15. Like and that happens all the time. You know, you just play everything. You're, you're 10. You're not a pro soccer player. You probably never will be. Just, just go, do something else. Totally, I'm gonna be the chillest sports mom ever after <laughs> some of the experiences that I've had. Um, but I totally relate to what you were saying, Bagel, about the kids are doing way too much stuff. Um, and I wonder when that became the norm. Again, it makes me feel as though it's just everything's a business your acting class, your soccer practice, your swimming class. Um, you got to be doing all these different things. It puts a lot of pressure on children, I imagine. Um, I don't know like what the best way to go about that is. And I know you guys were mentioning like, you don't need to specialize when you're 10 years old, but are you not going to be competitive at 13? And then you're not going to make the top travel team. And then you're not going to make varsity as a freshman. Like, it does tend to have cascading effects. So what would your take be if you have a 10 year old who shows some talent, they like playing soccer, would you tell them to play it all year round? Oh, uh, that's no. tough. Yeah, ideally I would say no, um, just because I feel like I know better. Um, but as I, you know, a lot of my patients are have children of multiple age ranges and they talk about how like they had that same stance and then five years later, they're just kind of like, you know, I have a, a patient that has, let's see, like a daughter that's seven and a son that's maybe 10, you know, it's like, my son's not going to play tackle football. And then, you know, this and that, and this and that. And then his son like saw football and he's like, dad, why didn't you let me play? And then he like let his son play. And now he's like taking his son all over the place and his daughter's doing like started gymnastics. And now she's doing like competitive gymnastics. And this is like, it's like one it's like one day you're like putting your foot down and then two days later you know you're taking your you're spending the whole weekend traveling all over the place taking your children somewhere mm -hmm. it's like it's like I, I don't even know like you don't even you don't even know how it happens so i thought that was an interesting insight um uh one of my my first job i had a lot of we had a lot of like uh professional ballerinas 
I didn't, it was a large city. So you'd see a lot of like kids that were doing homeschool and then also trying to like, they're all in these like ballet academies and stuff like that. Um, so it was interesting to see, you know, you have a girl that's 12 that, uh, you know, she homeschools, does ballet six days a week. And like every weekend is like a, well, I don't know what the, I don't know what you call the, the competition of ballet. I don't, I don't, can't think of the name of the, the show. She would have that every week. So, you know, 12 or 13 years old, six hours of ballet, seven days a week. And it's like always doing like showcases of sorts, you know, she had knee pain. Um, it's wild. You know, her, her dad's like, yeah, she wants to be a professional ballerina. And he's like, He's like, oh man, she's gonna have knee pain the rest of her life. Her problem was, you know, when you uh, what's it when you do toe out? Is that called plie? Mm -hmm. You guys know that? When you do plie and you bend your knees, like your knees and your toes are kind of in a line. Mm -hmm. She didn't have that hip structure, so when she like plie, when she like rotated all the way out, she couldn't do that. So whenever she would bend her knees, it would have like these weird angles in it. So when she did it over and over again, it would like irritate her knees. Mm. So basically she's the equivalent of like Muggsy Bogues playing basketball. Like she, she's not built for this. So she may make it, but uh, you guys old enough as Muggsy Bogues, like a too old of a reference for you guys. <laughs> you guys know who that is. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I got nothing for you. Got nothing for me. Oh my God. I gotta go. <laughs> no. uh, but you know, like her dad was like, oh, you know, is she going to have, you know, she wants to, she wants to do this. That's what he said. She's 12 years old. She wants to do this. You know, she going to have, when she's 35, is she going to have knee problems? And I was like, I was like, I don't know. I'll go find me a 35 year old ballerina that doesn't have knee problems and we'll figure out what she did. You know, and when I said that, I was like, I don't think that person exists, you know, and he like shook my hand. Like, cause I was like, I didn't like BS him. He's like, all right, we'll see you next time. Right. So every time she would like come in for treatment, it was like, how do your knees feel? And she'd say, you know, she'd tell me how they felt. And that would dictate what we did for treatment because I couldn't really do anything. She did so much anyway, like rehab. We had to like keep the volume really low. Um, So it was like it's wild because you make. You know, you make these you make, you're making a child make an adult decision. Because mm. once you start competing and doing it like for real like you, if you hurt no one cares right not not if you want to do it like if you want to go play travel soccer and you hurt you know when you're on a competitive team it's like hey this is, you know it's tough shit right but you know you're 14 is that is that the decision you want a 14 year old to make i i, I don't know the answer to that I, I would think the answer is no um but that's that's what we're doing right that's what that's what youth sports is doing so uh, it's a it's interesting to it's interesting to see it you kind of wonder what you're going to do when you're in that situation yeah and i mean not only are they going to have physical problems long term potentially but a lot of times it makes them just quit the sport they burn out so yeah, by yeah, there's all that. yep 16 they're over it because they've been doing it nonstop year round since they were 11 and they're like it's time to hang it up <laughs> it's just kind of preposterous but it's just what everybody does everybody has their sport and everybody specialized and it's the only way to get any good at it that's at least what i was told yeah so i mean the thing is you look most pro athletes played multiple sports though mm -hmm. yeah like i don't know where this thought process came from that you have to specialize in one thing like sure like you're not going to get good at throwing a baseball by playing basketball, right? But you're going to be a better athlete in general. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the sad, if you look at the, the NFL draft, I think out of the first 32 guys picked in the first round, usually like 28, 29 played at least two sports in high school. So, I mean, the, the idea that you have to play one sport all year round, your entire childhood to, to go pro is absurd. I don't know where it came from. I mean, I, I'm definitely seeing an uptick in, in injuries and in, in younger athletes. It, it's definitely worse. Hmm. I was talking to a baseball kid literally Saturday who was 
not even in high school, was already having elbow pain. No, oh, man. I mean, like... In high school? Not even in high school. He's already having elbow pain. He was 13 or 14. Jesus. And we had to shut him down for the whole summer from throwing. Because, like, well, if you want to pop your elbow off, be my guest. But they're going to lose a whole year. And then you're going to come back and probably do it again. And then, basically, your high school career is done at that point. But, I think that's the youngest patient in the clinic I saw with, I can't remember if they had Tommy John or not, but it was like 13 or 14. It's absurd. Oh, and that, that wasn't happening 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And that kid is not going pro. Like he wasn't going to go pro anyway. <laughs> right. That's the thing, right? If you're going to go pro, you can, you can literally play your sport one, one season. And if you're good, people are going to notice you. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a coach and I might have to, Doc, cut this out later potentially, but he played <laughs> baseball all through high school. Three years, senior year went out for football, one year of football, full D1 scholarship, goes to the NFL, catching touchdowns in the Super Bowl. Played one year of high school football. So if you're good, people are gonna find you. Yeah. You don't have to play 15 years of sports before you get to high school to be good. Because these kids are playing, you know, they're basically playing three seasons in a year. Mm -hmm. Like, they've already played more games they'll play in high school by the time they get to high school. That might be the thing with females is that they're using sports for the scholarships for school. Is that – it's because I don't know if – Oh, yeah, totally. I don't know if, like, you know, young Bengal would pretend he's going – he's – in the NBA when he was playing basketball, even though he knew he wasn't going anywhere. Like, I don't know. If, I don't know what the equivalent is for females. But right. But I, I'm sure, Conrad, you were told that, you know, you you don't have a chance to play in college unless you play club, right? You got to be a good club team to get seen. Oh. Right. I mean, that's what everybody he said is no told. Records. I mean, uh, no scouts would go to high school games. You have right. to. It's, it's so absurd. You have to go. And not only do you have to play club, you have to play at these three clubs yep. because you have the connections with these schools. It's a pipeline. The coaches are buddies. I would, so I was in a position where I was a better athlete. I mean, I'm sorry, a better student than I was an athlete. So I could have played somewhere, but it was like, why did I work this hard at school if I'm going to go to some random school that it's going to be difficult to get a job afterwards because I'm not going to go pro. So he's like, why don't you go to an Ivy League? Oh, so I can be $300,000 in debt because they don't give athletic scholarships in an Ivy League. And it, it like the whole thing was just so gross to me that he was not invested in my like me being in the best position I could be after he'd been my coach for five years, he wanted me to be on the website as another commit to this school. Um, and so I just, I just threw the towel in and I was like, one of the more crazy things that I've done, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to go play high school soccer with my friends. Screw this whole thing I've been doing for a long time. That's good. That's good. You made a, you know, you actually made a business decision. Like everyone's <laughs> making business decisions about you. And you were like, well, I'll, I'll make a business decision. So that's actually, that sounds like growth. <laughs> My dad was sad <laughs> at the time, <laughs> but he doesn't care anymore. Because your dad probably dropped six figures for, for club fees in three years on you. Um, that's okay. why he was sad. Club was <laughs> probably like, oh my God, I don't even want to think about how much money it was. And it got more and more every year. I don't want to think about how much it is now because I haven't played in five or six years. But that's what I don't get is I'll have athletes that I know don't have money. And I just wonder how they're paying for all this club. I don't get it. The like people that I know can barely afford like cleats. Like, are they really good? Some aren't, some are, are pretty average, but they're playing on, you know, the, those big three clubs teams you got to play on. Yeah. But, and they're playing all around. Like, how do you, how do you guys afford that? Like your, your shorts have holes in them. Do the private schools near you recruit athletes and give them scholarships? Everybody gets re recruited in high school. Yeah. They just don't get caught for the most part. It happens everywhere, though. So not just at private. Public schools will do it, too. Oh, yeah. Especially the, the big schools that, that churn out D1 kids. They just say, you come here, you're playing D1, which is probably true, but it happens all the time. Just They just usually don't get caught. I would say that's 
pretty similar to what I've experienced, but some of the private schools are like very, very good um, compared to the public schools. Yeah. Well, and the, the lower, at least where I'm out of the, the prep schools is they don't have the same organization that, that governs them. So there's, yeah. there's no issue. There's, there's no transfer rules. You don't have to, to sit out half a year, a full year that doesn't exist. So they can just recruit left and right and kids can show up and play day, day one. Ah, yes, that's true. But it happens a ton. It, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the norm, but it's definitely not rare. What's one of the more like annoying things that you've seen Cobra as an athletic <laughs> trainer? Like, is it the parents that bother you? Are the coaches kind of egocentric? Like, what what's one of the things that you have a gripe with? Uh, parents can be pretty wild, um, and that's that's kind of the the unfortunate nature of of my settings. I work with with kids, right? They're all minors, so mom has to be involved in, or at least notified of every decision, because the kids can't make those for themselves. So mm -hmm. that gets a little bit obnoxious. You know, I've had I've had parents. This might dox me too, but <laughs> I've had I've had parents threaten to to pull their kids out of the school over me trying to not play, have a kid play with like a broken arm, like just <laughs> abs absurdities. Like your your kid's arm doesn't even work; he can't even move it. Like why would I, I play him? And I'm talking like this mom had me on the phone like every night to like eight nine p.m. for like four weeks, just would not stop. So parents are crazy. Uh, <laughs> what is and especially about? because I have to be involved with them due to the, the athletes' ages. What is it about children in sports that makes parents go nuts? Uh, that's a good question. I think a lot of it, and I think a lot of what what stems from the all the club stuff and kids playing everywhere is the parents were were pretty average and mediocre in life and they're just living through their kids vicariously because they couldn't amount to anything <laughs> i mean that's a lot of it it is i mean hey like you were an average baseball player but hey your kid's gonna play six years of club baseball he's gonna go d1 and, he, and he's still an average athlete and can't even make his high school baseball team <laughs> but i mean a lot is is the parents are not always looking for the best interests of their kid they're looking at what they think is the best interest and don't even involve the kid in the conversation usually. Like, hey, sign up for club. You're playing on this team. Starts next week. Good luck. Didn't even ask the kid what he wants to do because the kid probably wants to play, you know, be banned in chess. But <laughs> um, I also think part of it is the clubs and the sports leagues, they're really good salesmen and they convince the parents of pretty improbable things. Like in my case, I was playing 10 year old, nine year old recreational soccer with the other neighborhood kids. And some guy from the club team or one of the club teams came up to me after the game and had like a CD of things that you could do to get better at soccer, play wall ball. And he had like a brochure for my dad. And he's like, oh, your daughter shows promise. And like looking back on it now, it's so ridiculous to think about right yeah, and i don't like, even think it's uh, nine-year-olds <laughs> right. and i don't even think it's it's the parents having poor intention it's the, you know they think hey if my kid's an elite athlete it's probably best for him when yeah the kid doesn't want that but they think it is so a lot of it's just not knowing or not talking to your kid and realizing what they want versus what they think is best because right you want your kid to be successful and you realize if your kid is a legit soccer player and gets a scholarship, like that's a successful kid in the parent size. But to the kid, they might just want to go to high school, hang out with their buddies. Yeah. And that's be, it. Be, play soccer with their friends. And and just be a kid. Yeah. Well, with that, I think I'll let you guys go. We've shot the shit enough tonight. Um for those who are listening. Where would you like them to go right now to read more for, of your content and see more of the stuff that you guys are producing? I'd start with the blog. It's just I'm hurt 
nowwhat.com. Straight and simple, gives you everything. No BS, just here's how to fix stuff. Here's how to manage yourself. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Sign up for the newsletter just because I've been, I've been writing more stuff and people have been unsubscribing. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again for both <laughs> taking the time tonight. This was a really fun conversation and I will see you around the jungle. Thank All you. Right. Appreciate it.